that we serve. And regardless of what we're called, where we sit, how our courses are designed, we, again, are doing what we always have done, right? We are teaching and training future lawyers through this incredible vehicle of externships and field placements. And I asked Ava permission, uh, my good colleague, Ava Loren, up there, um, to, to draw a bit of a distinction. We used the term and, and Kool-Aid, drinking the Kool-Aid, yes you did. Well, that historically, is an idiom, is a, is a term that has had a bit of a negative connotation. No, we it that way. Um, but we are not celebrating something that is inherently negative or needs to be embraced just because somebody needs to do it. We know that, with all due respect, externships are the gospel truth. Right? <laughs> we are training law students the way that law students need to be trained. And we are celebrating a, an incredible, unique, distinctive pedagogy, um, not something that is false or made up. Uh, no. We are here today talking with you about advocating for externships uh, on the premise that now is the time to make sure that beyond this community, this room, so to speak, that the truth is known understood and appreciated beyond our community and beyond the mandates of what the ABA has said in standard 304, 305, whatever it is. Today, this panel uh, is going to ask and hopefully answer the how, right? How do we effectively communicate the myriad ways that externship teaching and learning contributes to the broader goals of legal education? How do we communicate that externship pedagogy moves our home schools so much closer to achieving the learning outcomes that we have chosen to prioritize? Whatever they might be, externships do that. How do we communicate that externships benefit our students and future lawyers in ways that are different than other courses? Just as wonderful, just as important. Our premise beyond asserting that externships are the gospel truth, that's, that's my term, I'll, I'll own it, is that by spreading the truth, we can cultivate more support for our programs, more uh, support to improve the already good work that we're doing. That we can take our courses and our students and our law schools to even higher heights. And as we sit here today, the reason we ask those questions of you to the scientific raise your hand if this applies method is because we know that in this room we represent all different kinds of challenges, that we run different courses, we face different challenges on the ground where we come from. But we are today a community that has a lot to celebrate, that is now playing, as we always have, a crucial role in developing the next generation of lawyers, and that we need to continue making sure those around us at our home schools understand what we're doing so that we can get even better. And so today, we are going to talk with you about that. Um, we are gonna focus on what we have come to call the unique features of externships, and talk with you, drill down a little bit on how to message around those unique features, and we are going to then turn it over to all of you and do some work together in smaller groups to figure out some real tangible ways that we can take back that messaging to our schools and do the work beyond the work we're already doing to make sure that the message is known. So we are excited to be here. We're going to introduce ourselves by trying to answer those questions um, and uh, uh, then go from there. Again, I'm Danny Jackson. I'm from the University of Memphis, and I am the Director of Experiential Learning. Uh, that means that I have um, oversight responsibility for all of our in-house clinical courses. I teach one of those, a litigation clinic, and I am the only person that teaches externships at my law school. I have one adjunct who um, works with me. There is no other full-time faculty doing it at the law school. Um, I have tenure status at the law school. Um, many in this room helped me to get there, and um, uh, but I have been the only one talking about externships in my faculty meetings um, and among my uh, colleagues at the law school for quite some time. 
Susan. Okay. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Susan Brooks, and I am at uh, Drexel University's Klein School of Law. We have to name our better back from So, anyway. Um, so, good morning, and um, so my um, my role at uh, at Drexel is similar, somewhat similar to Danny's. My title is uh, Associate Dean for Experiential Learning, um, and I was hired uh, from the outset. Was some many of you probably know the school was founded in 2006. So I was hired from the beginning into this role where I oversee what we our version of an externship program. Um, as well as our clinics, our pro bono program, and our advocacy program. And I do have a lot of resources <coughs> the directors for most of the components that are underneath my umbrella, um, including a full-time external director who um, started the conference, although she may not be able to take care of that. We, um, and, um, so we, our school was actually, I mean, we're, we're probably on the one our school was founded with the idea that externships would be a core part of our curriculum. And so we actually had, uh, from the beginning, had myself plus um, three full-time teaching faculty, basically, um, or the equivalent of uh, teaching in the program. Um, so I you know, certainly feel fortunate about that. Um, can we stop there? All right. You know <laughs> So I'm Cindy Wilson. I'm at Reflection Sister School of Law in Chicago. Um, I'm a clinical professor. I started as an associate clinical professor, so I've done that progression up. I'm also, our um, externship program is in our clinic. We are a center in our clinic. All our clinic has different centers. So I'm the director of the Center for Externships. I am, I have, we have seven externship courses, and I have probably eight to ten colleagues in the building who teach those courses with me. Um, I teach two of them, other people teach other ones. I'm the only one who teaches externships full time. Um, other people teach other things in addition to their externship courses. Um, I do get to vote on externships and be in the room where externships are decided. So I feel very privileged. Um, but like everyone, I have my own challenges at my own school, but that's where I start from. And I'm Amanda Rivas. I'm at St. Mary's University School of Law. Um, I started uh, at St. Mary. I'm a St. Mary's graduate, and uh, immediately after that was a clinical fellow. Um, so I came from sort of the, the clinical pedagogy, uh, learning how to uh, <coughs> supervise students. When I was in law school, I like to joke with my colleague who's also in, um, in clinical director uh, that I sort of, after my first year, showed up in the summer after my one year, I was like, okay, I'm here, where's my office? I'm not leaving. <laughs> I really have it. I took a semester off to work in Walt and, and I didn't really go, <laughs> I haven't left yet. Um, but I'm the associate director of the externship program. I'm the only person who works on externships full time. Uh, I'm not on faculty. I'm uh, considered staff. Uh, I do work very closely with our faculty director or directors this semester. Uh, and uh, I'm very blessed to have a lot of institutional support, is what I'll be talking about today. Uh, and very much I'm a part and considered, um, you know, expert in ABA standards considered uh, for externship so it's helpful to have those conversations start with you know, someone who's been doing them <laughs> since the program started um, at St. Mary's and uh, but I do not have a vote or attend faculty meetings uh, but I am on the experiential learning committee and I am on the committee uh, for that with other doctoral faculty and work together very closely. Um, I do have an administrative staff person that I share with our pro bono, um, and I'm housed in the clinical building. Um, and I also um, work closely to teach. Uh, I come up with curriculum and teach and work with my co-directors uh, for our <coughs> curriculum component. So good morning. Uh, my name is Phyllis Cote. I'm at FIU College of Law. And I'm kind of, I, it's interesting when you look at the hybrid of where we are in terms of our status. So I, I literally was hired as uh, a clinical associate professor. 
uh, but in charge of clinical, kind of criminal, well, you know, when I applied, I had nothing. Um, so they hired me, they hired an immigration person, and we had a director of, of clinics at the time. Um, so I, I do share, I have five faculty status. Um, I'm able to go on clinical things. Um, so what, and, and in terms of what I do and how we're, we're able to do it, because I am seen as the externship person, I am given a lot of control or they, they will defer to me in terms of what should be done and what should happen. But in reality, just last year, we have a now associate dean of experiential, okay, so no one can go back and say this, um, <laughs> of, of our exper oh, of, of experiential uh, who just got a bar license last year. Um, and so it's interesting because if indeed what I do is valued, then certainly the opinion that I have would be one that's valued in terms of the knowledge and all of us that are part of the clinic. So every single person that's a part of the clinic, uh, prior to the, the, the newest associate, senior associate dean coming, have a substantial amount of experience, of course, in clinical or externship. And we are now hiring graduates with a year as director of clinics. And I'm like, you do know that's going to be an ethical problem at some point. <laughs> and, we're like, yeah, it's and, we, and we're actually kind of, um, our, our clinics, we're, we're, we've gotten rid of our clinics and we now have low bono clinic, so people are paying to have those new people represent them. So I have been separated myself totally and say, okay, that's clinic, and I am externship. <laughs> <laughs> so I encourage them to make decisions about that. Um, and, and we have about three other people. I'm the only full-time person teaching externships. I do a criminal, judicial, um, civil, and we added law office. We do private and non nonprofits, um, and now with law office, we do a full-time semester uh, with the very best of law firms. Um, those students are taught by the dean. Um, yeah. Well, no, not well. Yes, in conjunction. In conjunction. Yes, yes. So they teach that class, and I have nothing to do with that class. And, and that, that's been my. Decision. I said, oh no, you all handle it. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of it. Did I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the first discussions that we had when we started planning this plenary was to brainstorm about how externship pedagogy is different than other pedagogy and how externships provide students with unique opportunities that are not found anywhere else in the curriculum. So um, we thought that would be helpful for you in advocating, it was helpful for us in thinking about what was special. Um, and so the result of our brainstorming is this unique features of extra teaching, which uh, we will send all of you home with. You will hear some of us uh, refer to it throughout the program. And I would say as different as we are from school to school, we all agree that things, these were things about extra pedagogy. Um, so I'm sure you have your own, we could add to this list, but we tried to make it one page, um, and some key things that you can use around. And I will say the list acknowledges, of course, that externships are different, and we celebrate that difference. Um, you know, as we heard, sometimes difference is viewed as lesser, right? But we are going to take issue with that and argue that difference is a strength and one that we should use. Um, now that you have a list, you can use it. We're going to talk about advocacy, about where you might use this list, how you might use this list, as well as more broadly about how to advocate for externships. Um, we define the advocacy very broadly and have um, identified five areas that we're going to discuss when we talk about advocacy for externships. I'll just give you a little preview, and you'll hear a lot more about them as we go. Um, so the first is curriculum. That is, how do you develop your extra educational model and you design your course? The next one is awareness. That is, how do you build awareness of what externships are and what they do with different audiences? Um, third is collaboration. Um, what is the role of collaboration both in your externship program and how do you collaborate with others to advocate for externships? Um, the fourth is institutional support. How do you develop that institutional support that we all need um, for externships? <coughs> 
And finally, assessment. There's lots of assessment going on at most law schools these days. So how do you connect externship teaching to that institutional assessment? And we're also, obviously, these overlap. So you will hear some of us talking about some of the same issues. Um, and also, we're going to try to incorporate what we can success stories. Because it is always good to know that this can happen. And some of them will be big, and some of them will be small. But we need to celebrate our successes when they come. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about curriculum first. Um, and I first want to talk about our philosophy, because I think it's really important. We are very deliberately talking about a curriculum as opposed to a program. <laughs> Externships are a part of law school teaching. <laughs> if that isn't happening at your school, we're here to help you get there. If that is happening at your school, and you might you like to improve it or tweak it or change it, we're here to help with that too, right? Um, I think as we've heard elsewhere in this conference, while law school leaders and regulators are now acknowledging of the importance of experiential education, they are still slow to recognize the educational value of externships beyond the externships itself. Um, and externships, as we all know, are more than learning by doing. They are different from a summer job. And that difference is the teaching, right? We teach our students how to learn from experience. We teach them how to get and learn from supervision. We teach them how to reflect. We form an educational partnership with a field supervisor, and that is not happening anywhere else in the law school curriculum. That's us. Um, while our courses help students build skills that will get them jobs, we are not a job placement program, right? We are educators, and externships are courses. Um, it's the mantra, just keep it going. Um, <laughs> You know, we've had a fight to get others to understand this, right? And actually, of course, we are still fighting that battle um, for respect and understanding. Hence, uh, I'm already on advocating for externships. The fight continues. Um, a little bit about course design. I think the number one message here is there is no one right way to do this. If you've talked to each other, you will recognize that we have very different ways of teaching. And you are free to design a course that works for you and for your students and your schools and the type of place that you have. No judgment. That is, that's the beauty of this field, right? The range is incredibly wide. You don't have to choose just one thing. You can choose lots. I'm just going to give you a list of all the different kinds of things people do. Um, your class topics might include legal skills, professional skills, <coughs> ethics, professional identity, cultural competency, legal issues, career development. Reflection, <coughs> professionalism, <coughs> happiness, thank you, Amy, um, and mindfulness. Um, and, and there's many more, and I'm sure you have more that you can add to that list, but it gives you a sense there's lots of kinds of teaching you can do, and all of it is helpful. Um, we also think that all of these unique features um, contribute to a strong externship course, and that really almost all of them are able to do even with limited resources. So you might want to start by looking at this list and see if you can develop a curriculum that encompasses all of that. Um, of course, make sure you're aware of the ABA standards. There are some rules governing us. There's way more rules than there should be, but there are rules. You could develop a curriculum that satisfies them. Also, of course, there's lots of choices to be made, some of which may be made for you. Will your course be graded or pass fail? Will it be online or in person? How many times a week will it meet if it meets at all? Um, will it be online? How many credits will they get? And in fact, for some of you, those may be areas <coughs> for advocacy. So you already have a course that you want to fight for, um, you know, beyond pass fail or meeting more regularly or whatever it is. Um, finally, a RAD course design. Remember to think of your field supervisors as your partners in this educational process, right? You'll notice that many of our unique features of externships talk about the three-way relationship between field supervisor, the student, and the faculty member. We think that's an important part of externship teaching. And so working closely with your field supervisors, offering them guidance, explaining your pedagogy to them, um, helps make them a better partner in that learning effort. Um, of course, that's also why externship teaching is so much work. We don't get to just have a great syllabus, show up to our class, and teach. We have to do all these other things. Um, but that's, you know, that's part, that's the deal, right? That's the deal we signed up for. And sometimes those other things are fun. It's fun to get to talk to field supervisors and do all those kinds of things. 
five minutes and talk a little bit about resources. Um, so you've, of course, taken the first great step, coming to this conference, learning from all programs. Um, we encourage you to reach out to speakers. This is an incredibly generous community. Ask people for their syllabus, for their assessment tools. Um, I'd also encourage you to come to the clinical conference of the AALS Clinical Conference here in Chicago. Um, we are like um, in-house clinicians. We are experiential educators. And you'll get ideas from them, and I promise we will have externship um, programming at every time slot in that conference, so it will be worth your while. Um, take advantage of the lecturing site if you haven't already. Learning from practice is a wonderful thing, an easy tool to use in your class. You can use pieces of it or all of it. Um, talk to someone whose program you admire and ask them how they built it. I guarantee you it did not start where it is. It started from something else and it got to where it is. So um, we will share those ideas, those struggles. I mean, you know, we all have our own challenges. Happy to share those too. So finally, a little bit about success stories. So I'm going to talk a little bit, and then um, Susan's going to share a success story, too. So one success story I have around curriculum, frankly, is, is drawing in other faculty members, both the clinical and doctrinal, into my program. Having them help develop the syllabi, and then having me teach them the important things we have to include in an externship syllabus, right? So it becomes a kind of sometimes hybrid between their approach and the externship approach. And as long as we're checking all the ABA standards box, that's okay. Um, we also have full semester externships. Students can go anywhere in the country, and they have to have a faculty member who designs a tutorial for them, a three credit graded tutorial. That's been a great way of drawing in doctrinal faculty. So if I have a student at the SEC in Washington, I have a professor who teaches securities law. And so they design a syllabus that includes securities law, but also includes some of the externship things, right? And so then, in addition to building really great curriculum, as you see, things cross over. I have more institutional support. I have awareness. I have people across the building who get a little bit more what externships are, and they'll say, wow, that was such a great learning experience for that student. I mean, yes, it is. Um, <laughs> welcome to my world. So um, that's just one success story. So um, I just want to do one thing. As I was listening to Cindy, I was thinking um, this idea that, you know, I think that I can offer this for myself, but I imagine many of you who are experienced, who have gone through these experiences yourself, would also, as, as Cindy alluded to, be willing to kind of make yourselves available and that sort of thing. I just was curious, like, how many people have been in externship teaching, let's say, more than 10 years? Okay, so if you're new, Look around the room. Keep those hands up. <laughs> uh, because I think that most of us that have been at this for a while have had these kinds of challenges and, and, and continue to have challenges, but also have success stories and have things that we've been able to tweak and have had people who were really generous to us. And I'm going to name Leah Wortham, who was extremely generous to me when I first was a hand in this program. Um, and gave me lots of amazing um, suggestions about curriculum. And so, um, anyway, so I just want to say that, that and, and I'm you know, sitting here saying that you know, I'm more than happy to talk with anybody more about you know, some of the things that we've tried that have been helpful, some of the things that we've tried that haven't been helpful, <laughs> that I wouldn't suggest necessarily. Um, so my story, though, is um, goes, goes to uh, what Cindy was talking about in terms of getting doctrinal faculty um, involved, and, and really it's partly about awareness too, but it's also about curriculum development, as well as how to um, engage uh, supervisors in the, in the actual curriculum development. Um, we tried in a very explicit way to talk with our supervisors about how they are our teaching partners. You know, they're part of the development of our pedagogy. They're not just like practitioners out there. Um, and so um, one of the ways that we bring this together is that, you know, and I know many of you probably do some kind of orientation or some sort of um, events or activities with your supervisors. So we created uh, uh, an, something that we call a round table. We decided not to call it orientation because we want them to get the messaging that they're the experts. That they're, so we draw on their expertise and we invite doctrinal faculty to the round table. So 
So each semester we feature a couple of doc final faculty and we integrate their expertise <coughs> into the topic um, that we're featuring. And then we also get, uh, you know, get our supervisors involved. So they're sort of putting, we're putting this together as, as a unified um, event. Um, and so part of what it does is it exposes our doctrinal faculty to what we're doing, to our pedagogy, to our field supervisors, and vice versa. They get to see some, and they feel, I think, more a part of the institution because we're bringing our doctrinal faculty to that um, event. Um, and we've been able to actually develop and tweak aspects of our curriculum through some of the inputs that we've gotten from faculty and from supervisors. Um, so that's, that's you know, just one thing that we've been doing. And what we do is we give, we used to actually give two, two free CLE credits. We would do it over a lunch hour. Um, and we would get a, a law firm. We actually do have law firm placements. But we also had government uh, offices where we, they host it. So it's at a convenient location for a person in the city. Or so, you know, it's where the law offices are, basically. And people can escape for a lunch hour. Just to give you a little nuts and bolts. Um, so we decided to hone it down to an hour of CLE so that we didn't have to fill the whole two hours with CLE because people start to, you know, need to peel off. Um, but even that, you know, free CLE lunch um, and, you know, an hour of engaging, um, you know, kind of conversation. So that's been something that's worked really well for us. Uh, I want to talk for a few minutes about awareness, how, the how piece, um, how we are spreading that gospel that I talked about earlier. Um, and I want to focus first on, on the who. Who are our targets? Um, it may seem obvious, but we need to be talking with our faculty colleagues. Regardless of where we sit in the law school, our faculty colleagues need to understand what it is that we do, how we do it, and how the learning that we promote through externships feeds what the law school is doing at a broader level. And those are important and oftentimes difficult conversations to even have. Right, to, to get in the same room. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that this is putting us on the spot. Because often those conversations aren't coming to us, or they're not coming to us in ways that we want them to be coming to us, right? So we need to bring those conversations to the different audiences. So engaging faculty colleagues, we need to be promoting awareness about externships to the administration at our law schools. When I was hired as the experiential learning director. Uh, the externship course was uh, each semester, if faculty teaching in a certain substantive, substantive area wanted to uh, supervise a student in a placement in that area. So labor law professor uh, working with a student in at the National Labor Relations Board, if there was an extern there that semester, um, that's how it happened. There wasn't a course component. There was a monthly check-in with timesheets and a uh, journal at the end of the year with some reflection. Um, each of the externships were approved as their own courses. So when I came in, I worked with my associate dean to develop one externship course that would bring everything under this umbrella. That, for me, strategically, was what was going to work. And so going to the administrator, the associate dean, and explaining how externships worked, what they were, that this is a course. This is not just sending students out and having them report back. But there's a lot more to it than that. And keeping my dean up to speed on the discrete successes that our students are having. Having that conversation on an ongoing basis, almost reporting, how that has resulted in, for me, the dean going out and cultivating placements that then are referred to our program. Sometimes I have to tell him to stop. <laughs> he is sending, he's having a conversation that I've not had with a judge, or with an administrative agency, or with general counsel at a company. And it translates that way. And most importantly, he's open to my feedback and is deferring on those kinds of ultimate decisions. 
because he understands better what externships are. And I mean, I have educated him on the standards as they've changed, those sorts of things. We in this room are the most informed about those issues. And we often need to be reaching out and being affirmative in explaining what is going on in what we do. Career services. Many of you sit in career services offices and you understand best at your law schools what externships are and how they work. At my law school, and this is no slight on the career services office, they don't. They offer internships. They promote, you know, they distinguish between internships and externships. And they did come in to what they are doing with an understanding of how externships work, that they are curricular, how what we do has a distinctive pedagogy associated with it. So I have meetings with our career services folks to talk about what's going on in our world, in our course, where our students are from semester <coughs> to semester, just to make sure we're on the same page. But often it is reaching out to say, let's talk about this. I want to hear what you're doing. Sometimes it's about hearing what other folks are doing and seeing where there is overlap, where there are common issues. We need to be promoting awareness about externships to our students. And I mean before they enroll in our classes, before they understand what externships are because they want to sign up for a course or go work in a certain area. So it might mean for me, it has been going out and getting time <coughs> for, to speak to the 1L class in explaining the experiential curriculum and the standard and telling them how externships are different, that it's a course. Because guess what? From my faculty colleagues, they're not hearing that externships are a course, that they're part of the curriculum. Sometimes they're not hearing anything at all. But when I'm not in the room, or somebody who's taking an externship, a student is not in the room, often the message is a student one, and they come talking to me about the extracurricular opportunity that is the externship. So if we could be affirmative in reaching out to students, we should be. And telling them up front how externships, like torts, like administrative law, like clinic, fit in the curriculum. That's what we are, part of the curriculum. We need to talk to alumni about how our courses work. Sometimes those conversations can result in great field placements. But our alumni need to understand that externships are more than just sending students out to them or to other placements. They need to understand our pedagogy. They need to understand that we are carefully regulated, <laughs> that we work differently, that we are a course, and that we are part of the curriculum. What are we promoting awareness about to those audiences? Cindy has already talked about some of the big ticket um, uh, curricular messages and the associated uh, uh, topics we need to be sharing. But I want to repeat, we are part of the curriculum. We need to remind ourselves of that all the time because often that's not the message around us. We are teaching. We are not running or administering or even directing. We are teaching our students through the vehicle of externships, field-based learning. That's what we do, all of us, regardless of what our title is. And that needs to be part of our message, even when we are staring at somebody who doesn't want to hear it and is looking at us like this. We need to be consistent in that message, and it's important. We need to be talking about the distinctive pedagogy, the unique features. This is an incredible list, and it was inspiring to be on these phone conversations where we are talking about how wonderfully different we are and how rich the learning that our students do is in our externship courses. We need to be drilling down with our colleagues, making sure there's an understanding of just how different our courses are, that we work with field supervisors. It's not sending our students out to them. We are partnering with them. It's different than teaching contracts. It is. It's not better or worse. But it's not better, it's different. And we need to emphasize that. Help our colleagues to understand. Help those constituencies I'm talking about to understand. We are a partnership that extends beyond the law school building in very real and not just physical ways. We 
are carefully regulated. I don't think that our colleagues teaching most of our one out courses are thinking about what the ABA standard says about how we have agreements with field plays and supercomputers. They're not thinking about looking at the ABA standards and how they might be evolving from year to year and how they've changed over the last five years, ten years. We need them to understand that now, front and center in our accreditation standards, is not only a standard about experiential learning, but field placements, right? What we're doing. We need to make sure there is an understanding among all of these constituencies that we're talking with about how we're regulated. And it's not just the ABA. We have labor considerations to think about. We have all kinds of other issues that we are thinking about. We have a lot that goes into the design of our courses that makes us different. As part of that, externships are a lot of work, right? We aren't just in the classroom. We're not just prepping to go and teach. We do that here, but we do lots of other things, and we need to promote that message as well. Um, we, how, how do we do this? We need to be thinking about tried and true public relations methods. We need to be going out, and if it means a newsletter that shares the successes of your program, go do it. If it means having lunch meetings, if it means uh, figuring out collaborations, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, then let's reach out and foster those collaborations. There may be different stories, uh, different kinds of partnerships, different outreach opportunities, depending on who we're speaking with, depending on the history, all of that. We've got to be considerate. But we need to be affirmative. Right? Again, it's not going to come to us. We have worked for everything we now have in the standards. And for the recognition that experiential coursework is now getting. And yet still, we need to be going out and talking about why it is so important that we keep getting better, that we keep getting recognized, and that we stay at the center of our curriculum. We need to develop allies. And you can do that. Um, even though sometimes it seems like there's not an ally to be found. Um, just to share some success stories to finish up. Um, I shared yesterday, so I apologize for those who were at the compared session that Avis and I did. But last year, the University of Memphis, with a graduating class of somewhere between 100 and 110, placed, uh, I think the number is nine, <coughs> of our graduates in federal clerkships after graduation, okay? I mean, that number's like, I don't know, I'm not good at math, but like almost 10%. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? Historically, the University of Memphis doesn't do that. Well, I know, because I know those students, that eight of the nine not only took the externship course, but guess where they externed? With federal judges. And it wasn't only uh, students going to the placements where, you know, working for the judges where they extern. No. They got hired in other jurisdictions. They got hired by different judges. Two on the Sixth Circuit. Okay? Because of the externship, of course. And when they were asked about it, for some of the PR that we got uh, our magazine to do and on the website, yes, what they said was the reason. The externship course. And so we talked about it at a faculty meeting. And people, some of my colleagues who I love, who have never had a, any word to say about experiential, guess what they were talking about? The externship course, right? And I don't know if it'll ever happen again. But we have wonderful relationships with our judges, and that has made this possible because of the externship course. And you all do that. And you don't just do it one off. You do it every semester with every student you place. There's always a success to be shared. Figuring out what it is and going out and spreading that message is our responsibility. So, go. <laughs> and I'll share a success story. Um, an example that things take time. So I've been doing this for 18 years. When I was first hired, I was hired to teach one extra course, a public interest course. Um, and I worked part-time, and I did some other things, but I was hired as a faculty member to do this. Um, and as time went on, our school extra were siloed. There were 
seven courses, but they weren't talking to each other. They were in different parts of the building and just one, you know, after another. And, you know, nobody was thinking about the ABA standards, I don't think. Um, nobody was thinking about this is kind of one pedagogy that we should have some shared common values in our classes. Um, and I recognized that and thought that was something we should be working on and started to mention it to people. I started coming to these conferences and like come back and say, guys, there's a whole lot we're not doing that we should be doing, right? Um, but then here's, here's what the real motivation was. I had a kid going to college. I wanted to work full time and my school has a tuition benefit, but you have to work full time. So I like, okay, I gotta figure out a full time job here. So I started going to people and saying, you know, we need extra trips should be coordinated. They should still be courses, but they should be together. They should be under one umbrella. And I said, and the perfect umbrella would be our clinical place because our clinic has all these centers and because kind of the people that I'm most empathic with were in the clinic. Like, I liked those people. Those were my buddies. Those were where I felt my bliss. So I, you know, started finagling and negotiating and um, I said, let's try this. And so they got, they bought into the concept of yes. And then I said, and then I need to be in the clinic because in order to really be a clinical faculty member and to share, I need to sit there. They're like, oh, well, space is really tight. But okay, this year there happens to be one office. Temporarily you can have it for this one year. <laughs> so I did. I moved in, right? And then, you know, squatters <laughs> rights, they were not getting me out. And I, I went to, you know, I signed up for committees on our clinical faculty. I was in the hallways. We shared things. I recruited a couple of them to teach externship courses in the summer. Um, and at the end of the year, they actually did try to shut me out. But by then, everybody rallied around me and said, no, we want Cindy here. We're going to figure out a way to make her here. And so they did. Um, and so for the last eight years, I have been in our clinic. And um, I, it has just increased the awareness of what externships do, because they see me, and they hear me speak, and I talk about them in our meetings. And so now, um, certainly our clinical faculty has a much better awareness of who we are, what we do, and lots of them have now become so one of the things we, we really knew was, was the key, and I think you hearing that is really the key uh, to success or externships, is this whole concept of collaboration. You know, what, what, what does it mean? I mean, so we've, we've talked about working with, with, with your doctrinal faculty, trying to figure out ways in which they can contribute uh, to that aspect, and that really becomes key in terms of building um, a sort of stability for your program, and stability for you in terms of recognizing and understanding. Um, but another part of that collaboration is your becoming um, a part of that, um, of the decision making in terms of what happens with faculty. So one of the things that happened um, for me in, in, in terms of talking about the importance of, of, of collaboration is that I actually applied for a Fulbright and, and, and got a Fulbright and, and, the, and the faculty was like, you got a Fulbright? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I, I, I did. So and what happened as a result is the doctrinal faculty was then called on to teach while I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to key members to talk to them about it. Um, but, but that year in terms of, of their involvement in terms of what I do, not only did they get, I can go, yo, here, you take this. I can't believe all, a whole class or every single, because we literally have a two, hour, uh, a two credit class that accompanies every single externship, and I teach those classes. And they, they, they just utilize three different doctrinal people to do it. <laughs> so we, we literally had to get a person doing the civil, doing the criminal, doing the governmental, and they, and they just could not believe. So, so, I, I, so one of the key things I think uh, that I took away from that um, was that whole idea of, because a lot of what I would do is just keep them out of my business. A lot of it not bother me. I'm okay. But bringing them in, and that, that method of collaboration, I think, uh, was key to their understanding how very important uh, what we did was for the faculty. Um, and, and so we had a six hour experiential requirement already because I'd already said that students had to have, you know, needed to have this and it could be clinical or, or, or uh, externships, but they need to do it. And, they, and so they understood it when the, the ABA requirements uh, came out. So one of the other collaborations and other ideas uh, that happens is this whole concept of working with career placement and planning. Now when they finally um, made or decided that externships could be paid, 
which of course killed me. Um, because what, you know, one of the issues I think for all of us is how much control do I then lose in terms of the quality of that placement? So that's a conversation I have with, with paid externships um, in terms of you understand this is difficult for me because you think you're paying the person so you can have them make up. But you understand you signed, signed this memorandum of understanding and we talk about substantial legal work that the student would be having. What does that mean to you? So I have this conversation. So, so part of what we had to do in terms of learning uh, and collaboration was working closer with our career placement and planning. We are totally separate. You know, they do the placement, but now that people are paid, they want more of an involvement in those paid externships um, that may impact, I guess, what they're doing in, in terms of what happens. So, and, and, and you have to um, not be afraid of, of kind of the evolving nature the evolving nature in terms of, of what happens um, and, and, and what happens in terms of externship. So I think one of the key, um, I think, successes that, that I've had in terms of thinking about externships and, 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 and talking about them has been this whole concept of involving the field placement in terms of um, the teaching and aspect of what we do. So let me, let me explain what I mean. So when I started, when I got there, um, I developed a, a, an externship that was an externship in terms of criminal. Students went to the public defender's office, but I asked them, can those students have only cases where there was a delinquency or dependency a part of it? And then we had their, those same students handle the dependency portion of whatever was happening in that kid's life. So all of a sudden, the same attorney is handing, handling the dependency and the delinquency for this kid. And we had an educational advocacy clinic, and that professor then would handle, with that very same student, any educational advocacy issues that may be going on with that student. So all of a sudden, we have this collaboration of faculty from criminal to civil or administrative for dependency, um, or, or civil for dependency, and then administrative for the educational advocacy, which really opened the door for our students in terms of not only the experience that they got, but the takeaway for the faculty in understanding the impact. Because one of the biggest things they talk about, uh, and I understood as a practitioner, was kids don't know what's going on in their case. They'll have a dependency case, a delinquency case, the attorneys don't talk, there's a different attorney handling each of the cases. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the clinic was, we are a juvenile justice clinic, and we handle the total child. So if there's an issue, we're going to be there, we're going to handle it. And we'll just figure out which of the professors will be supervising um, as you did it. They never heard of that when I suggested this whole concept. But it was that collaborative effort in terms of coming together with our faculty and the field supervisors. So the public defender's office had to be convinced. We only want those crossover cases. Find those for us and give us those cases. Or give our students those cases. And then we will be supervising them on, different, on this different aspect of it. Um, and, and a final type of collaboration in terms of, of our, um, our externships is one that we're trying to embark upon right now. And um, we, uh, we have a, pump, a state attorney's office in Florida that all of a sudden now will have an uh, innocence project. And they want to go back and investigate uh, cases in their office. And they've asked our office, our, our students, to work on those cases even though their office is in um, Jacksonville. And it probably would make much more sense to have the University of Florida handle it. But we got it. <laughs> um, so, and one of the things that will happen is that all of a sudden that's a field placement that our, that our students have. Um, they're going to have it as a result of that collaboration. Um, and, and, and what we <coughs> hope to open up is, or what I hope to open up, because I also share the title of director of pro bono programs, is, is, is adding that social justice aspect of we need to be doing good in whatever you do. Make a difference. Um, <coughs> And one of the biggest struggles that, that I think I have in, in terms of, 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 of my faculty is that there is only a value that's attached to white red firms, um, working for lots of money, and thinking that is the only key to success. So one of the things I struggle with with students is having them understand the importance of giving back, the importance of making a difference, the importance of having a total life um, regardless of what you decide to do. 
And, and I see opportunities like this collaboration where it's a prosecutor's office that is making that decision about looking at our, our, the innocents and saying, see, prosecutors do justice, you know, because that's the other thing too, you know, you can only, um, and, 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 and realizing that they need to open the horizon um, in, in terms of what happens and, and the opportunities that, that present itself in, in terms of, of, of collaboration. Um, I think one of the, you know, they're all, there's all sorts of pedagogy that talks about collaborations and how you collaborate. So one of the important things, though, I think that you have to have is this relationship of trust. So, I mean, you know, when you start talking about collaborating with people, sometimes they're not the right person to necessarily handle uh, certain aspects. So you need to be able to be honest about why you want that, the role that that particular um, agency or the aspect of what they're doing can help in fulfilling the curriculum, um, fulfilling um, what you think is important. And, and I think that's where we become very important in making sure they understand as externship professors, we bring a, a, a level of expertise in terms of this is what our students need to learn. This is the reflective opportunities um, that, that we require that you're going to have to think about making a part of what you do. Um, and and it, it is through those collaborative efforts that I think we open ourselves up to being able to develop those kind of opportunities and hopefully to, to develop kind of prolonged ones with them. Um, I know that, and, I, and I'm going to defer to you at this point, um, Amanda, in terms of looking at um, uh, institutional support, but what, what has happened as a result of, of these different kinds of collaborations, collaborations especially, from my perspective, is, is um, our institution has really um, bought in to how very, very, very important our externships are, which is now why they're all thinking, well, can we do another one? Can we do this? And the dean said, well, I'm going to do one, and I'm going to teach them how to do, you know, whatever. But, but it, it really can become a, a key way in terms of getting the institutional support, and, and I know that's what, what Amanda's going to talk about, and solidifying that, that institutional support in terms of what you do. So um, the, the great part about this is that we, we're adding layers here. Right? Yeah. So I'm going to continue to pull from what everyone's done. So beyond sort of the cheerleading of the awareness component that Danny talked about, and of course using all the curriculum and the special unique features of externship that we're doing, and we add on another layer of collaboration, you know, we realize we're sort of garnering all this power, right? Externships, I love this idea that we have power in our uniqueness. Um, so even if we don't have faculty status, like I don't, uh, we can use all of these components together and harness this power in order to sort of frame that and, and take that power from the work that we do on its pure form. But garnering institutional support really can, it becomes strategic um, because you can, it means becoming and demonstrating how externships and their power is a critical vehicle for accomplishing institutional goals. So it incentivizes the institution to support externships because they're contributing to the core strength of their own existence, right? Um, if the university decides to invest resources to strengthen its values and its goals, which you know happens all the time, then there's a case to be made if we have fully embedded ourselves as externships to continue to have some of those resources come to externship. Um, conversely, uh, if there are goals and values that we're substantially tied to with our program, then cutting resources from externship might weaken our ability or the institution's ability to obtain those goals and values. So, like most advocacy work that we do, we're going to have to build a case around connections that already exist through our externship work, or think about establishing those connections. And we've talked about some ways here. So I'm gonna go really quickly through, because I know we're running, I think, a little bit low on time here. Um, first of all, you need to start identifying the core values and goals that the institution has identified and has seen and been working on. Uh, and then align any of the elements of your program to strengthen those values and goals. This means usually looking at your school's mission. 
Um, and if you're working from the school mission the way that I work from the school mission, then one of the things that stands out most prominently is the pro bono aspect. Um, my program does a lot of um, public service, government. Um, we just started some in-house councils. We don't do private firms. And I'll talk about how that's a possibility later. So pro bono really giving the chance to work on some of these legal aid, the nonprofit organization. If you're showing how some of these externship programs are exposing students to that legal services gap, and that's something that the law school values and it has a part of your mission, then making sure, and this is where assessment's gonna play a huge part, um, is that you're in your final assessment asking those questions. Did this externship expose you, student, to the need for pro bono services? And then even if you don't have the pro bono services, pro bono by association, if you don't have those externships, if you have like ways that you're having students work together in small groups or talk about what they do, um, you can do the pro bono by association question in your final externship. Did discussions about other externship students work expose you to the need for pro bono services? So that's one way to sort of get that in there if you don't have uh, all of your students doing that sort of pro bono. The other one is you look at the missions of often building ethical practitioners, right? And all of, of course, through our ABA standards, that's what we have to do in the curriculum with externship. It's often what we're doing and where students are really getting that first experience and really understanding and they're, they're feeling challenged and they're in that uncomfortable zone of the first time handling their first ethical situation or, or something that could turn into a situation and acting upon that. And that's a lot of what the law school's missions are now doing. So if you're doing that in your curriculum, if you're exposing students to that through their externships and having those conversations, making sure in your assessment that you're talking and highlighting some of that work and what the students got out of that. So you can use that, again, to build your case for institutional support, given that your externship is doing a lot of that exposure. Now, the other part um, that we do as externships is foster and strengthen ties to alumni. Sometimes uh, through our collaborations with maybe field work supervisors that we're doing, um, maybe even some of the adjuncts that we're working with to help teach, but the alumni are there and when they're working with us in these collaborative efforts or we're raising awareness with them, we have to make sure that they have a stake in the success of our program when they're working with us. And so when alumni have some skin in the game in one way, shape, or form, I like this idea of the workshops, round tables, and bringing doctrinal faculty and potential alumni together and some of the work and, and using that to sort of garner and make sure that that collaboration is another tie that we're making that will help the institutional support. Um, because, as you know, uh, the deans like when the alumni are involved, the, uh, the development office enjoys that. You know, they have some sort of stake in the success of your program, and that's all coming together again to foster that strength and that power. Okay, and we're a part of the curriculum, as we heard here, right? It's paying attention. We're a part of the curriculum. We enforce the curriculum that's happening often. And sometimes we fill in gaps, potentially, in the curriculum. Um, so if there's um, IP, maybe, is not something that you have a professor teaching, or entertainment, I know there's some examples from my law school. We don't have a lot of those uh, happening right now. But we do potentially have some externship placement that could give students that exposure. Your ability to sort of be a part of the conversation in curriculum mapping. Um, and if you're not a part of the conversation or aware of any curriculum mapping that's happening in an institution, that's one way you can start to make sure to establish that connection, working with the doctrinal faculty or your teams, or academic teams on what's happening with the curriculum mapping and seeing where you're fit in there. Uh, but also, the, along with ethical, observing and applying professional behavior, usually a part of the mission as well and expanding some of the skills like the legal research and writing. We're giving them more opportunities to practice, sometimes to create writing samples that they're using for their next step professionally. They're getting more feedback, not just from LRW, but from us and their supervisors. Um, and then they're addressing sometimes in externship, our curriculum also does the skills that are a little challenging to teach outside of the law school and being able to show the institution, you know, we're handling some of the case management, the organization, the client relationship building, some of the things that are often a part of the mission or the goals. Um, and retaining, establishing and maintaining relationships with community partners, 
both legal and non-legal through our externships is another way of garnering institutional support. Again, usually the deans enjoy that exposure and the embeddedness you have in your community, so anytime you can make those connections. Uh, admissions also often likes to highlight a lot of these connections that we're doing. And the connection between the university and faculty that are entrenched through that. We've talked them in collaboration and in awareness, having those collaborative meetings, the awareness, whether it's getting them to do some of the teaching, uh, working with to develop curriculum, all of those things. That means even when you don't have status like I do, I have friends around the faculty meeting who are talking about some of those collaborative efforts and the value that the awareness, the cheerleading that we've done, the collaboration, all of that comes together and builds power there. So uh, in the end, building this case of institutional support means putting together the data. Uh, and oftentimes, working on all the things we've talked about, building it, a really assessment can be a big key to that because you're gonna need to show that and demonstrate that when you're building that case for institutional support. So I think that's a really good transition to start talking about assessment. Okay. So we know we've been talking at you so to speak for a while, and I just want to make sure everybody knows after I sort of go to this last topic, we're going to turn it over to you and have you identify you know, maybe one of these or maybe another area that you want to focus on and try to do some um, kind of thinking together with each other. So assessment. So um, we all know that we're in this moment of legal education where we keep hearing about assessment. Um, how many of your institutions have gone through a process of identifying institutional learning outcomes? Show of hands. Okay. And how many of those institutional learning outcomes have included some component of something like professional identity formation or something like that, or professionalism? Just by show of hands. Okay, so a lot of you, right? So, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, it was interesting when we were putting this together, we got to assessment and we were kind of like, like, what do we know about assessment, right? And I think we're still at, an, at kind of an early stage, and so what I'm gonna present to you is not necessarily what I've already done, but what I'm kind of planning, hoping to do um, in terms of thinking about how our externship uh, course is in a lot of ways uniquely situated to inform the assessment that we're going to be doing going forward, right? Because once you identify these learning outcomes, you're going to be expected by the ABA to demonstrate that you're assessing them in some ongoing way. Um, and one of the things that I realized pretty quickly that we have been doing, you know, all along, and we've been trying to figure out how to kind of make more of, make more use of them, is supervisor evaluations. So how many of you do supervisor evaluations? Okay, so there you go. So you have a source of assessment of your students, of course on an individual basis, but also that you could look at on a programmatic basis, or a curricular basis, excuse me, um, to, to really get more information about those learning outcomes. Not just the ones around professionalism and professional identity, but I know our evaluations include you know, things like writing ability, research and analysis, communication, um, help me being in the back of the room. Uh, what else do we, we ask all these different things on our supervisor evaluations that go to different aspects of our learning outcomes, our institutional learning outcomes. So, you know, we, I think we need to think about, first of all, tweaking our supervisor evaluations so maybe they use more of the language that's in those learning outcomes, and then to think about how we can take that data and you know, kind of use that to uh, feed back into our faculties, whatever committee or group you know that you might have, or uh, how we're going to try to start collecting that data and feeding it back. And I think, by the way, that is also part of curricular development because you know one of the things that we have done um, fairly early on is to at least use those supervisor evaluations to kind of sit down with our um, first year legal research and writing faculty and say, here's what supervisors are saying about our students' strengths, but also about things that they find challenging. And you know, maybe we need to put more focus on you know, certain aspects of legal research. Um, so, so there's a, a particular aspect to that um, that, can, that can be programmatic in, in a more granular way. But I think then there's this other level of assessment where 
I, I think our programs are, and again, this can go to institutional support. It's like we are kind of this snapshot in time, right? We can offer this snapshot in time of how we're doing in a general scheme of what we're trying to teach our students and, and how they're learning it. Um, and we can use that, those supervised evaluations, as that kind of snapshot of, okay, at this stage, here's where our students are. Um, and so, you know, obviously we have students that are doing these as they go out the door, but I think to the extent that we're collecting them every semester from some group of students, I think that's a, a really wonderful vehicle that can be at least a starting point um, and a sort of a core component of some of the um, assessment that we need to start doing. Do you want to add something? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So anybody else? Before me? Okay. So now, what we would like you to do is to um, find maybe three or four other people. So you could actually lose some four. Three or four, per se. Um, and what we would ask you to do is, you know, just to go around the group, introduce yourself, you know, not the language of, and encourage people to go outside of their own institution so that we can get a real cross-pollination, I guess. Um, and you can either choose one of these areas, so you might want to define your goals, uh, as your goals in terms of one of these areas, or you might want to think about a specific audience, like, you know, alums, or faculty, or part of the faculty, or like clinical faculty, or students, However you want to think about um, where, where you need to advocate more. Um, and then, you know, take turns really, you know, kind of sharing where you want the programs to be. And seeing if together you can, you know, for each person in your small group, come up with some concrete ideas. Um, and they may be things that were mentioned, they may be, you know, hopefully new ideas. Um, because then we're going to come back and try to get some of those new ideas so that we can sort of add to this uh, list.
not leave enough time for this. And we're encouraging that this is a great, we hope, conversation starter to continue over the break, to continue over the rest of the conference. Uh, but we wanted to just end by getting a couple of you know, good kind of nuggets from your conversations that might be useful for other people. So just quick, maybe anybody that wants a hand for people that want to share? Yes, and just say your name. Speak as loudly as you can. Teresa Walsh, Golden Gate University. And I was thinking, as I was hearing all these great ideas, and I wanted to bring awareness to my supervisors. I thought, well, what if I sent the syllabus to the supervisors? And then thought, wait a minute, if I send the syllabus at the beginning, they'll never look at it again. So why don't I just basically send them a quick email, have my list, all my supervisors, the learning objective for this week, for this is uh, advanced legal research, and give them one concrete. We're going over secondary sources in class. Make sure your extra knows your secondary that you would go to. Yes. Wow. Talk, talking about our teaching and our rising and our teaching and having such a, a, like a record to be able to advocate around that and using even like an app like Calendly to get all of those meetings into your Outlook calendar, your Google calendar, and that way you can look back and say, I had 20 hours of teaching this week because they were all student advising appointments. And it's then really easy to stack that up against other people who are teaching in the law school and have faculty status and say, hey, look at all the teaching I've been doing. You know, there's a pedagogy around these meetings, like this is really important stuff. And it just creates a really nice record of, of, of that. So wonderful. Yeah. 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 So uh, this came from the ADR world, and I'm going to apologize to my group because I didn't mention it to you. <laughs> um, but I think it really came from your idea. And I missed you at dinner last night, but we'll talk later. So, yes, no, we're I know. Right. We're we're but, okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, some of you may have heard of the Stone Soup Project. But anyway, what it really, the bottom line is, I realized I've been doing it all along. I have my externs interview their supervisors on some topics. They have to do reading, they interview their supervisors, they write a reflection paper integrating it all, and then we do rounds in class because I have mixed externship. And I've never thought to say, oh, collaboration and engagement with my supervisors. I do not ask my supervisors permission or warn them. <laughs> Bad of me. <laughs> but it's working. Great. Great. All right, at least one or two. I think you can get one or two more ideas. Yes? Well, we talked about um, wanting to engage with alumni and talk to alumni or somehow use alumni who have gone on to do great things in their uh, work after they've graduated and how to, uh, you know, alumni, development alumni relations is often very protective of their email addresses and that sort of thing. And so um, we talked about just, you know, reaching out to, we tend to be very siloed, particularly with administration versus faculty, and to just reach out to those people, and they're often very happy to have somebody who's excited about something and who wants to engage with alumni, and go to them and say, how can we, here's an opportunity, how can we do this in a way that you're comfortable with, and how can we partner together? And they seem to have been very receptive in building those bridges to the various departments. And by the way, alums are a great source of like support for our curriculum, right? It's the alums that actually appreciate yes. what we've done and the reflective component of what we're doing. And so bringing them in and having them talk to current students about, you know what, this class is the really most important class you're having law school. And most useful, right? And talk to your administration. Yes. <laughs> um, one thing I committed to doing is sending an email once a semester out to my, you know, all school staff, faculty, you know, numbers, kind of where some students are, just kind of, you know, hey, keeping this on your radar screen. I just realized it's busy in our world, and then like I'm not doing the outreach I need to do. And I know Rita, who's here now. Every time we get an email from a supervisor, from a former student saying something like a success story, we send it to the administration. Right? Everybody know this student got a job and said that they got the job because of their externship. Or this supervisor raised about the student we had last semester and sent an email. We make sure we circulate those. Well. All right. Uh, one last. I don't want to have last word. Somebody else want to have last word. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. Thank you.